the church in general. I will be basing my talks with you, my sessions with you in this webinar uh, by having my book as the reference, The Believing Filipino Catholic Youth, A Search for a New Narrative. So it was published by uh, the Philippine Association of Catholic Religious Educators Incorporated. Although, the, as already uh, mentioned in the cover page, the opinions presented in this book and in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the opinion, the official stand of the organization. Rather, it is of the author and of the speaker. So, having the preliminaries, those of you who might want to have a copy of, uh, of the book, which is, uh, in that, of course, it's uh, inverted in the video because I am on a selfie mode. But uh, for those of you who want to have a copy, you may want to consider a donation, a small amount of donation, so that you can have a copy of this book, which is very, um, without uh, modesty aside, uh, this uh, book can really help us understand the perspectives that are now uh, prevalent or uh, or emerging in our society. Uh, let us start. The first chapter or the first session that I will have with you will deal on the ideologically driven world. We are living in an agenda driven world. My dear friends, there is no such thing as neutrality that is really difficult to establish that uh, there is neutrality. It is an ideal which oftentimes is not achieved. But what we have actually are sort of uh, biased in a way or subjective way of looking at things. Of course, there are objective truths which we cannot deny. Like for example, uh, 1 plus 1 is equals to 2, the laws of gravity, or you might want to say relativism now, it's improving also in the way we understand nature, but it's there, you cannot deny it. Uh, Unless you subscribe to the idea that uh, everything is a construct, even that scientific theories are uh, constructs. So if you subscribe to the idea, then everything will indeed be subjective. And so, but my point is, whether we like it or not, neutrality is something that is a bit difficult to achieve because it can have so many forms. It's so as they say, it's so fluid, shapeless. Uh, that's why in this world that we have now, in our society, we have to make a stand. You have to take your principles with you and, and live the principle or stand on your principles. Whether successfully or not is uh, not relevant in the discussion, but the point is you have to have your principles. In that context now, the battlefield as I see it, the, the, the place where we do the influencing is of course the minds and the heart of the people. In a postmodern world, in our world nowadays, it is often the heart that is the battlefield. And once the heart uh, is, is uh, won, the, the mind will just follow. That's, that's the prevailing uh, concept nowadays. That's why if you notice, in the, in the advertisements or in the movies or in the articles or even in argumentations or even debates in the academic field, it will always be biased towards the emotion. So when somebody will tell you a heart-rending story, a story of brokenness, a story of uh, you know, poverty and misery, then most of the time it will want the hearts of the people as well as influencing them. And that is the reason that we noticed that uh, in the so-called reality shows or contest, even talent contests at that, they would always give you a background of the person, uh, where he came from or where she came from, uh, what 
suffering she endured, uh, the, 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 the trials of life that this person is undergoing or uh, went through. So in other words, it gives you that uh, touch, that emotional touch. And most often, most often, people, like when you're voting for that a contestant, for example, oftentimes the more heart-rending the story is, the more suffering a person endures, the more likely that she is going or he is going to win. And it can be abuse. It can be abuse. And in fact, it has been abused and there are cases that have been abused. Uh, as long as you say something sad or that uh, you just uh, claim, your, claim or accuse other people that they abuse you or that they maltreated you, immediately the, the people will be biased for you already and biased against the one that you accuse without searching really for what is, what is really true, what is really happening. I remember one uh, actor in the United States it's by a certain mullet, I think, something like that. He is uh, a man of color, and if not mistaken, also of a, uh, I think I think he identified himself as a gay person. So, uh, in one of the videos, I think he made an accusation that he was harassed by the police force in that place. I forgot where it is. And then everybody was already uh, condemning the police department or the police district. And then all the media, especially the mainstream media, uh, went full blast in condemning that uh, so-called uh, uh, police brutality and so on and so forth and and then it turned out that Mulet is actually lying he is just making up stories but after making up so many stories there you go the entire media the mainstream media went into a full blast attack and everybody is uh, consoling him everybody seems to be with him but it turned out to be false. So that is the point that I am trying to, to tell here. If we are going to just rely on our feelings, then it, it is very difficult. Why? Because feelings changes. And everyone has their own feelings. So what do we get from here? Or, and where do we get from here? The proposal that I am making here is we have to identify first the agenda of a particular group or a particular person. It can be the media, it can be the newspapers, the printed, the printed media, uh, the magazines, the comics, the what we have else. Uh, what else nowadays, newspaper, because magazines are no longer that uh, famous, I mean popular. So, but anyway, the pamphlets, the books, and then the booklets, and then and so many others that are printed on paper. Also, the media that is broadcast in the radio and the television. The uh, web, that's now already the fourth media and the most powerful I think if in certain regions of the world if not entirely around the world because there are still uh, regions of the planet wherein we don't have internet connection so we can say that uh, maybe the broadcast and the printed are still you know striving surviving in the, against the onslaught of the web so as I said you don't you just don't take hook, line, and sinker everything that you hear from the quad media, if I may say so, from the, from the printed media, from the broadcast, the television, and then the internet. You have to be discerning. There are so many things that are being uh, 
sent out there through this medium or media, but uh, sometimes they are not true. So, the chapter, the first chapter of my book, I entitled it, Living in an Agenda-Driven World. We have to admit that our world is driven by agenda. Everyone has an agenda. For example, I came across a remarkable book, well, at least in the title, which I really love and I brought a I bought a copy. It's by Annette Simons. I hope they pronounced the name correctly. It's by Annette Simons or Simons. And the title of the book is Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins. How to use your own stories to communicate with power and impact. So the title itself is uh, very remarkable. It says, whoever tells the best story wins. And that is, I think, what is happening in our society. Whoever tells the most uh, convincing story, and the most convincing story is usually translated as the most... Uh, heart-wrenching, heart-rending stories, the stories that would really break your heart and uh, that would touch people. And once you do that, I, as the author uh, proposed here, tells us that uh, whoever tells the best story usually wins. And that is what is happening in the media. And in our halls of government, sometimes they have to get one singular uh, isolated case and prop it up in order to make a point. Now, for example, here in the Philippines, there is this, uh, there is this uh, case of a transgender who went into the bathroom of the women. And here in the Philippines, when we say transgender, that is still uh, a person who is transitioning from, as they say it, transitioning from male to becoming female. But all the organs are still there. All the features are still there, except for some alterations like a breast implant, but the sexual organs are still intact. So, that particular transgender female entered into the female mm, CR, comfort room or restroom, whatever you call that in your particular country. And then she was accosted by uh, the female security guard telling her or him, whatever the pronoun is, to transfer CRs because this is for the females. But again, there is a commotion, etc. And uh, she was handcuffed and uh, went to the office, I think, or the, I don't know if she was, she was sent to the police or whatever. And then that's it. But is the, the, does the story end there? No. The story went. Uh, shall we say with went with a big bang, just like a nuclear blast. Even the Senate uh, held an inquiry on that. Imagine the Senate of the Republic has to, has to launch an inquiry because this is no longer for them, especially for some uh, advocates, advocates, particularly, for example, some particular senators there in the Philippine Senate. And uh, what happened now is uh, it is no longer just merely a question of which CR to use, but it has now become an issue of discrimination against the LGBTQIA+. So, okay, and uh, why, did, why is it that they, uh, they try to emphasize it, overemphasize it? Precisely because it's a good story. Although that is just one isolated case. I mean, or... That, but because if there are other cases, I would argue, then maybe they should have filed it or, sh or raised their hand or showed it. But why is it on this particular case? So you see, my dear friends, especially those of you who are listening, and I hope are like-minded with me because my webinar is actually not the, here to convince but to expose a, or rather to describe. No? So would, I hope that if you are not of the same wavelength, well... I am not here to convince you. I'm only here to describe what I see. So it all depends on you now. 
So as I said, and I already repeated this several times throughout this webinar, that everyone has an agenda. Everyone has an agenda. No one is exempted from having an agenda, including myself. I have an agenda here. And what is my agenda here? My agenda is to, to, to help people understand the situation in a manner that they are not rendered helpless cognitively. So I would like to shift the focus and restore it back to that platform of I think rather than I feel. Because when we feel, we cannot we have no way to correct it. Because everyone is, has the right to his or, or her own feelings. And you cannot command feelings. It happens. It is a reflex uh, response. But thinking can be corrected. Thinking can be modified. And that is the, the thing that the postmodern world and the advocates of these ideologies that are considered on the left of conservatism in the United States, for example, the leftist, conserv the leftist liberal movement, they are very allergic to thinking because they would always emphasize, I feel. But the problem with I feel is that everyone is, or rather everyone has a different feelings. So how can you say uh, this is the correct feeling or this is the correct way of emotions. No, you cannot. You cannot command feelings or emotions. And neither can you change it because it, will, it is inevitably, to, it is changeable at all times. No one is feeling angry at all times. No one is feeling happy at all times because it is going to have a psych psychic overload. If all the time you are just angry and there must be something wrong with you psychologically, because the psyche will only be able to sustain a certain amount of sadness and melancholy or else you will be falling into depression. On the other hand, if you are all laughing all the time and uh, always happy all the time, then there must be a problem also. Why? Because uh, laughing all the time can also be uh, uh, turned into manic or mania, as they say. So, the natural homeostasis of the body, of the heart, of the psyche, is that it, it is changing, changeable. Uh, one minute we are happy, for example, but later in the day we will be a little bit tired, a little bit sad. But then again we will bounce back and we will become energetic again. So it's a fluctuation. And that is, I think, the nature of feelings and emotions. It is constantly in motion. Of course, uh, the, the frequency of the changing of the fluctuation will also be depending on the mental well-being of the person. So those whose emotions fluctuate just in a matter of seconds or minutes, and this is also something that needed to be accounted for there. And I'm not saying that so. But in the normal cases, what we have here is that emotions are indeed fluctuating. And as I said, you cannot correct emotions. You cannot say, ah, that's correct emotions, this one is not. No. You can elicit the kind of emotion that you want. Like for example, if you are portraying a sad uh, documentary or a sad storytelling, then of course the, the, the desired uh, emotion is that of sadness and melancholy. And if you are showing a comedy film or telling a happy story, and then of course the desired effect emotional effect would be uh, that of laughter and happiness. You can do that. And that is what is being manipulated by those who are driven by the idea, by ideologies. So they are most often would want to uh, use emotions in their films or in their media. Now have you noticed that nowadays even commercials are not just merely showing to us the product. For example, uh, if you're going to show uh, an advertisement on about uh, fried chicken, for example, oh, sorry, fried chicken, what do you get? 
you just don't say ah the fried chicken is good it's crunchy it's uh, it's um, it's fresh it's tasty whatever adjectives you have there but nowadays the advertisement of fried chicken would be combined with uh, with a, with, a, with a sad story or a memory of longing for example remembering the past with your father accompanying you or your mother accompanying you to that uh, to that uh, fast food chain or that you have um, it is where you met your loved ones or you met your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever the case is so you see is no longer just about the product the chicken but the it elicits an emotion to the viewer that ah because everyone has a has a memory so it's touching the the memory the heart and that is also very good but also very dangerous at the same time why because emotions can be manipulated according to your agenda okay so but the question of whether it's right or wrong no more as long as you think it's okay as long as you feel it's okay then it is okay that is the postmodern proposal let me fo move on those advocates of uh, this particular way of looking at things would often uh, fabricate an aura of neutrality and objectivity sometimes that they are the ones who is real or they are able to, to connect with the reality and those who insist otherwise are most often accused as biased or prejudiced so if you will say something against an ideologically driven proposal immediately they would they would shout at the top of their voices ah that's prejudice that's bigotry that is so uncompassionate for example like for example what's happening with the philippine scenario at the moment with regards to the to that event in that mall well the it has now been the excuse for the relaunching of the sexual orientation and gender identification expression bill that they want it to be passed into law now look at that if you will go against it if you will speak anything against it immediately people especially those loud majority mi minority the loud minority those who are in the media those who are in the social media those who are in the other industries that has the platform they would immediately tell you that you are a bigot or you are a prejudiced person you are a unfeeling person you are a, a, you are not compassionate you are not merciful you are biased and you are you know so many other things whatever the merits of that it's up to you really to determine based on your conscience but the point is the point is that there is so much intolerance from the ideologically driven advocates actually instead of just looking into the facts into the details into the real they would come up with their own versions of what is real and take notice in the plural versions because sometimes the story keeps on re repeating and revising itself and then what happens next is that you will now be accused bias or prejudice if you are not going to subscribe to such a kind of thinking now people will say oh, no i don't have any agenda mm. whenever the people will say they don't have any agenda they are actually having an agenda having no agenda is an agenda in itself you cannot just say i have no agenda so I come here in all neutrality. No, that's just a politically correct way of saying that you have an agenda. Because having no agenda is an agenda itself. So there's no such thing as a clean slate or a blank sheet. No. Okay. 
So what we have now at this point, and this is something that I would like to reiterate, there are leaders. And nowadays, we have the so-called thought leaders, thought leaders, uh, influencers. And they are actually influencing the way we think. Uh, the, the, this, this group or this sector of uh, leaders, they are the ones who will come up with, a, with an idea or uh, ideology and then they would prop it to a certain level that it is uh, having a crescendo and then later on what you will have is actually the, the influencing of the minds. And there are so many ways to do that. For example, in the, in the news, for example, news are not objective at all. They are biased. All news are biased. Not, no exemptions. Uh, that's why when you read the newspaper, whether it's the local newspaper or it's the national newspaper or it's the international newspaper, that is a biased way of thing, looking at things. That's the editorial bias, as I say. Because the editor or the newscaster or the news writer, when they write things, they don't, don't write describing the object or the event as it is. They are actually writing it based on what they see, what they heard, what they touch, or, or the senses, for example. And they interpret it in by writing it. You cannot excavate the facts, I mean the, the past or the event. There's no such thing as excavation. So it always be interpretation. I think that's very important in principle. All are interpretations. Because, for example, two witnesses might witness, or two or three or more, might witness a certain event. But when you now ask them to narrate the events, it will be depending on how they receive it. And that is the something that I remember during my seminary years that says about quid quid recipitor ad modum repisientes recipitor. The, what is received is dependent on the mode of the receiver. And that is also the way we look at things of the world. The way we see world varies according to our own interpretations. So thought leaders or influencers would create a certain way of interpreting the world, interpreting an event or a situation, and propose it and give it to those followers that they have. And that is something that we have to be wary of because sometimes we just thought that this, this, this is it, this is how it is, but no, it's not. It's a always, it's always a biased interpretation.